Thank you for attending the fourth Josiah Henson Leadership Conference, and thank you to everyone joining us on the live stream. Thanks to Montgomery Community Media for once again hosting this important leadership conference. I am Mike Nordalili, the Executive Director of the Montgomery Parks Foundation. Catherine Leggett, who chairs the Foundation's Josiah Henson Capital Campaign Committee, couldn't be with us today. The Montgomery Parks Foundation raises private funds that supplement, not supplant, taxpayer support for the 421 parks in Montgomery County. After you hear about the inspiring story of Josiah Henson today, you will understand why our highest priority is raising funds to build a museum and education center on the very soil, on the very soil where Henson was enslaved off of Old Georgetown Road in North Bethesda. If you'd like to help us share Henson's remarkable journey of freedom with others, please contact the Montgomery Parks Foundation at montgomeryparksfoundation.org. The Montgomery Parks Foundation is proud of our partnership with Montgomery Community Media in these Josiah Henson Leadership Conferences. I would note that these conferences have already shaped the themes that will be part of the new Museum and Education Center. During previous conferences, we have discussed Reverend Henson's leadership and how he changed the view of slavery throughout the world. Our panelists have had open discussions about how he helped pave the way for opportunities for all people today. And we have also discussed what progress still needs to be made. But it's important as we educate people on Reverend Henson's story so that we make progress and not regression. June 15th was Reverend Hedson's 229th birthday. Uh, we had a birthday party for him on Saturday at Josiah Henson Park. The foundation is charged with raising funds for the Josiah Henson Park Museum and Education Center. It is my job to make sure that people never forget this man's inspiring story so we don't have to relive it today. This truly will be the year of Josiah Henson, with four books being published and the release of a documentary called Josiah Henson. It is my honor to welcome you here this morning and to welcome our host for the conference today, Ed Reed. Ed is past president of the Montgomery School Counselor Association. Ed. <laughs> Yeah, good morning. And just one slight correction, past president of the Maryland School Counselor Association. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Gnarly. Hello, everyone. My name is Ed Reed, and I'm a high school counselor at Poolsville High School. I've been partnering with MCM for many years to bring programs to you about teen mental health, as well as a show called Congratulations Year In, which helps high schoolers get into college. I am honored to be your host for this conference. The topic for the first panel is black images in mass media, starting with Uncle Tom and going to the very successful Black Panthers movie. On the panel today, we have Dr. Hercules Pinckney, President Emeritus at Montgomery College, Wendy Howard, owner and CEO at WH Consulting, as well as Richard Turner, Executive Director at Carroll Community Media Center. They will all come up and say a few words, but first, we have something we would like to share with you. Who was Josiah Henson? A lot of people still don't know the remarkable story of Josiah Henson, and the big part of this story took place in Montgomery County. The Montgomery County Parks Foundation is working hard to tell this story. Here's a little video to get everyone up to date on this man's amazing journey and what Montgomery Parks has done so far. As a child in Charles County, Maryland, Josiah Henson saw his family sold away from the plantation and out of his life. He almost died from neglect before he was traded onto the Riley Plantation in Montgomery County, where his mother lived. Henson never saw his father or many of his siblings again. He sometimes worked in the stables on Riley's plantation 
As a strong, intelligent, and resourceful worker, he fast became one of the owner's most loyal and trusted enslaved laborers. Riley once had Henson lead a group of slaves on a journey to Kentucky through the free state of Ohio without supervision. None of them, not even Henson himself, attempted to run away. While enslaved, Henson converted to Christianity, married, and began saving money to buy his own freedom. But when Riley cheated Henson out of his savings and threatened to sell him, he escaped to freedom in Canada with his wife and children. There, he helped to establish Dawn, Ontario, a settlement for fugitive slaves from the United States. He later dictated his life story to a local writer. The life of Josiah Henson, formerly a slave, now an inhabitant of Canada, was published in 1849. Three years later, Harriet Beecher Stowe patterned Uncle Tom's story on Josiah Henson's real life in her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly. In Stowe's novel, the slave master kills Tom for refusing to reveal the location of two female slaves. Stowe's fictional account of slavery was a blockbuster hit. In reality, Reverend Josiah Henson lived a long and full life, becoming a successful businessman, community leader, international speaker, and a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Impressed by his story, Stowe wrote the preface for the next edition of Henson's book. Henson became known as the original Uncle Tom. His fame spread and the community of former slaves in Canada grew. On a trip to England to raise funds to help the Dawn Settlement, Reverend Josiah Henson was presented to Queen Victoria. Yet, despite Henson's honorable life, Uncle Tom has taken on derogatory meanings through the years. But nothing could be further from the truth. In Harriet Beecher Stowe's fictional novel, Tom was a martyr. The real Uncle Tom, Reverend Josiah Henson, was a Maryland hero. Now, we'll hear our panelists' thoughts on today's topic, black images and mass media from Uncle Tom to Black Panther, the movie. Our first speaker is Hercules Pinckney. Hercules is President Emeritus of Montgomery College, and he currently serves on the Board of Directors at Holy Cross Hospital. He graduated cum laude from Claflin College and earned a master's degree in education from South Carolina State College, and he earned his doctorate of education from Virginia Tech. Hercules is an adherent activist, a brilliant Renaissance man, and his fascinating history includes major contributions to the Civil Rights Movement. Welcome, Hercules. Please come up. Thank you so much, Ed. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. What an honor it is for me to share this morning with you as we continue these very critically needed Josiah Henson leadership conferences. We need a more accurate American history, including Montgomery County, so that we are not misled by the inaccurate portrayals and the downright omissions of mainstream media of positive black images from Uncle Tom to Black Panther. Your presence here this morning signifies that we are all in agreement that the preservation of the true legacy and untold history of our people is important. My remarks are from my civil rights perspective of how black images in the media have impacted my life and by extension, how these portrayals of blacks influence the pre prevalent perceptions and attitudes of American society toward we as a people. I will also draw from a number of other sources, including an article entitled, 
portrayal of minorities in the film, media, and entertainment industries by Yuri Horton, Roger Price, and Eric Brown. I was born in the South. I was raised and educated in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Now, for those of you who don't know where Orangeburg is, it is a small college town smack dab in the middle of the state between the capital city of Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina. Orangeburg is significant in civil rights history, in part because it was the site of the Orangeburg Massacre. At 10.33 p.m. on the night of February 8, 1968, eight to 10 seconds of police gunfire left three young black unarmed men dying and 27 others wounded on the campus of South Carolina State College where I was matriculating toward my master's in education degree. The three students who died were Samuel Hammond, Delano Middleton, and Henry Smith. Delano Middleton attended and graduated from Wilkinson High School, the same high school I graduated from two years earlier. So I knew his parents, his family. The death of these three unarmed students marked the first such tragedy on an American college campus. And this happened more than two years before gunfire by National Guardsmen in Ohio killed four students at Kent State University. But unlike Kent State, the students killed in Orangeburg were black, and the shooting occurred at night, leaving no compelling TV images. And due to the lack of media coverage, The incident that night hardly pierced the American conscience. It would take decades later before the truth of that horrible night and subsequent actions and inactions were made public. Today, you can Google Orangeburg Massacre and see the black images and read more accurate accounts of the tragedy and its aftermath. Generations since my own would never have known of this local history and legacy had it not been for the diligence of a persistent group of individuals and others who were committed to making known the seemingly lost bit of history. Kind of my, reminds you of what we're trying to do here with Johiah Henson's. The childhood images to which I was exposed through the mainstream media were all negative, whether it were in the newspaper, on the radio, or in the movies, but especially television. It was not until the TV show Julia that I saw a black woman for the very first time who was a professional and not a maid. Black history taught in the segregated schools I attended, and reading Ebony and Jet magazines were my primary sources for positive black images. By the time I reached college in the early 1960s, my black heroes had expanded to include civil rights leaders, educators, and business persons. By then, a few more television programs featuring blacks in more varied roles came onto the scene. However, there was always this underlying tension, in a lot of cases, outright contradictions between what I'd been taught 
about my race and how we were being treated by Southern whites. This was in large part due to the fact that many people in this country, some of whom who had never encountered black people, still believed the degrading stereotypes of blacks that were portrayed on television. Everything they believed and knew about blacks was determined by what they saw on television and in the movies. My participation in civil rights marches, sit-ins, and demonstrations was inspired by positive black images coupled with the chant, I'm black and I'm proud. More and more people of various races began joining our struggle for equality, and this was another source of encouragement. And while the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Bill were not yet passed, I began to envision a day when I would be able to go to the college or university of my choice, reserve a room in a hotel, and pursue a career based on my aspirations. Yes, we've come a great way from the time when Sam Lucas was the first black actor to have a lead role in a movie for his performance in Uncle Tom's Cabin. That was in 1914. But just a year later, another motion picture was released. The Birth of a Nation was released, and this film supported the white supremacist group known as the Ku Klux Klan. Many have characterized this movie as possibly the most anti-black film ever produced because of its vicious portrayal of blacks as less than human compared to the glorified depiction of the Klan. However, this devastating setback gave rise to the creation of a new industry that produced race films. There were four African Americans and about African Americans. This development created images that had not been seen before, and they were intended to dispel the stereotypical shifting, shiny face, head scratching simpletons with bugged out eyes, leaning on a broom, and speaking bad English. It became obvious that in order for blacks to ensure that they would have positive role images, they would have to make their own movies. And we experienced an era of black exploitation films, which were popular in most black communities, but did very little to correct the image of blacks in the majority American population. The stereotypes of blacks is deeply ingrained in the psyche of the American public. Any content that attempts to alter that stereotypical image is uncomfortable for a lot of people. And they simply change the channel, not go to that movie, not listen to that program, or not read that book by that author. Additionally, one of the greatest challenges to generating black images that promote healthy attitudes towards blacks throughout American society is the persistent need for financial profits. The profits are needed to sustain the media, whether it's television, radio, the movies, digital, and of course, social media. This makes it extremely difficult to bring pressure on networks and film producers when their shows and newscasts are making money. This, of course, can be attributed to the positive portrayal of the majority and the negative portrayal of minorities. In this industry, the bottom line is money. So what are we to do? Is part of the answer having more media giants like Oprah Winfrey and Terry Perry, Tyler Perry 
Shonda Rhimes? Is it acquiring local news outlets and television stations? Or none of these? Should we try something altogether new? If it were not for the black images portrayed in the movie Hidden Figures, how many of us would know about the contributions made to the American Space Shuttle program by Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn? Just imagine how many black images and stories which were, we are unaware until the opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And if we are honest with one another, the majority of us would be unaware of the images and stories of Josiah Henson until re relatively recently. Therefore, we must call on our faith as Josiah Henson did and keep the conversation alive a conversation designed to specifically improve race relations and social justice through more accurate portrayals of black images in the media beyond Black Panther. Thank you. Thank you, Hercules. Our next speaker is Wendy Howard. Wendy is owner and CEO of WH Consulting, vice chair of the Maryland Black Chamber of Commerce, the immediate past president of the Women Business Owners of Montgomery County Board of Directors. A native Washingtonian, Wendy is widely known as a local leader, supporting small businesses and promoting sustainable practices. She is the executive director of One Montgomery Green and has won numerous awards including the Green Champion Award and the Rising Star Award. Welcome, Wendy. All right, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reed, um, for that kind introduction. I want to thank Mrs. Leggett, the Parks Foundation and Montgomery Community Media, um, and all those working on this effort for including me. It's a wonderful enterprise, and I am really happy to be involved. This discussion of black images in mass media is a broad and complex topic and extremely difficult to cover in a few minutes. <laughs> but one of my esteemed panelists helped me put it into perspective by wisely suggesting we tackle the topic through the lens of our own experience and expertise. As a self-proclaimed video file, a comic book fan, and a member of the baby boomer generation, oh, I told you guys my age, um, I have spent most of my leisure time watching movies and TV. I began my love of film at really a very interesting time or a very interesting trend in Hollywood um, in the 60s um, as Hollywood became more socially conscious, um, asserting itself during this time, these tumultuous 60s. No longer bound to the Industry Production Code, which banned representation of sexual relations between black and white people, African Americans began to move away from the singing, dancing, and cleaning roles available to the during the 30s, 40s, and 50s. During those early decades, or the golden age, most depictions of blacks were seen through a white lens. African American male, excuse me, African American male roles were typically what is characterized as the Tom roles. Uh, the Tom was a whitewashed version of Stowe's character. He was a, a black man without sexual prowess, generally old, feeble, and accepting of whatever his white master asked of him. There were a few exceptions, but it wasn't until the 60s that we began to see a different image, where I began to see a different image. In the 60s, actors like Sidney Poitier brought a more complex, multi-dimensional character to the screen instead of the one-dimensional Tom character. This is what I grew up with, and these are the images that have made an impact on me. Though some still characterize many of his roles as Tom roles, it's my opinion that he and the many actors who worked uh, during those earlier decades led us to where we are now. I really think a significant change in these images came from the smaller screen. The proliferation of the color TV set, which became more common during the 60s because the price was cheaper, um, brought more colorful characters into our living rooms. 
um, female characters seem to fare better than uh, male African American characters. Um, characters like Diane Carroll show shows Julia, in which she portrayed a single mother. Her army captain husband died in Vietnam, so but raising her son. This was something that really spoke to me. Um, shows like Room 222, uh, Good Times, Roots, and of course Soul Train provided a contrast to the black exploitation movies of the 70s. But I went and saw them all. Much of those TV sh excuse me, much of those TV shows, as opposed to the black exploitation movies, were once again seen through this white lens. We begin to see a change in that with the 80s, um, the inception of shows like The Cosby Show, a groundbreaking show depicting an upper middle class family. This was something we hadn't really seen before. Oprah Winfrey, oh my goodness, she really brought to home into our, our television stations a woman of color who was strong, had a business, and was making money. Um, and then, of course, something I didn't realize just recently, Sidney Poitier directing Stir Crazy, one of the highest grossing films made by an African-American director. We start to see real characters, not, character, not caricatures. Um, uh, they became more mainstream and were, <clears throat> excuse me, and were more prevalent in movies. We started to see movies like The Color Purple, still, though, once again, seen through a white lens. African-American directors like John Singleton and Spike Lee brought us Boys in the Hood and Do the Right Thing. Now we're starting to see things through a black lens. This trajectory continues to rise, however slowly, but allowing more directors to direct more mainstream movies. Roles, from African, roles for African-American men and women are growing, and a new black superhero came to the scene. It's not Black Panther, it was Blade. I don't know if you guys remember that. Catwoman in the 90s. And of course, leading to the ultimate superhero, Black Panther. I think we're experiencing what I think is really, truly a golden age. Uh, last year, for the first time in the Oscars history, a black actor was nominated in every acting category in the same year, with Barry Jenkins' Moonlight winning Best Picture. The popularity of the movie Black Panther further illustrates my point of viewing the images through this different lens. Is this a natural evolution and an inevitable, inevitable conclusion? I really can't say, but I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to see it, and I hope to talk more about it. Thank you, Wendy. Our final speaker for this series is Richard Turner. After working in media for more than 30 years, Richard truly is an industry expert. A prominent figure amongst his peers, Richard's resume boasts top titles such as president and owner. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Alliance for Community Media and is executive director at the Community Media Center of Carroll County. We are especially excited to have Richard here today because he is also the former executive director at Montgomery County Media. So Richard, welcome back. Please come up. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Ed. Tony, wherever you are back there in control room somewhere maybe. Uh, Michael, Catherine, my fellow panelists and guests. Um, having spent hours working to create this physical space in which we're sitting, it's heartwarming to see it used to convene and consider the impact of Reverend Josiah Henson and the struggle and accomplishment surrounding identity for peoples of the African Atlantic slave diaspora. I am the splintering of America. I am not the axe, not the maul, nor the wedge. I'm the pent up energy released unnoticed by most. I struggle with the notion of presenting. I'm the product of two educators, my father with a doctorate, my mother with a master's ABD. And I'm keenly aware I can't claim to have studied or researched this particular important topic. But I'm a practitioner of the field, as you heard, organizing media makers. So keenly aware about imagery and what happens with the impact of that imagery. 
When it comes to mass commercial media, I'm a cynic and yet an optimist. I guess that makes me a critic. <laughs> that through analysis and persuasion, there will be an answer to the shortcomings I have observed and with a call to duty would expect some change. My objective here is to connect some of the dots in the short 10 minutes that we've got together um, and discuss the biases in mass media, uh, especially in the areas of television, film, and especially digital media, which is sort of my focus. Now to comprehend critiques requires some context. Talk a little bit about the influence in my lives. And by way of introduction, I wanted to recognize being that we just uh, did Father's Day, let me share going back three generations and speak of the influences in my family chain, what brought me to here where I am today and the whose shoulders I stand. My maternal grandfather, Richard B. Moore, was influenced by Hubert Harrison. He was an early 20th century activist, writer, orator, and self-taught educator. He said, oldsters love ruts because they help them to rub along. They are easy to understand. They require the minimum of exertion and brains. They give the maximum of ease. Harrison urges us to shun a rut as you would shun the plague. The plague. Set it before you as a sacred duty, always to surpass the teachers that taught you. My paternal grandfather was uh, uh, Frank Turner. He was influenced by W.E.B. Du Bois, early 20th century activist, author, and sociologist. Du Bois said, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his, by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. I am the splintering of America. I am the energy release evidenced by the auditory crackle and pop of seemingly still life bound together and the dust of a thousand hardened cells being burst apart. Now I'm going to attempt to spin this a little bit from what has happened, you've heard about history, to what is happening. It's interesting here about Birth of a Nation. I sat in a film, my first exposure to film when I was studying in high school. I think it might have even been the first film that we had to watch was Birth of a Nation. Um, the only film I remember from that class. <laughs> uh, certainly impressionable. Now, talking about Black Panther comes at, in at the 16th highest opening, only Afrocentric or Afrofuturistic fiction in the top 200 million mark for an opening day. That is unless you count Ice Age, Dawn of the Di Dinosaurs, which came in at 55. Black Panther Worldwide Grosses comes in at 9th with Lion King at 37th. All right, that was an animated animal. So yes, this is an indicator of some progress, yet from over 3,000 Oscars, only 36 to Afro-Americans, one producer, no director. I have 3,000. So how can we break this down? I'm not a cognitive neuroscientist, nor have I ever played one on television. I could don a white uh, doctor's coat or talk with a, a f uh, fake a British accent that would make you think perhaps I had a higher IQ. But instead, I'll dazzle you with my ability to enter a search term in Wikipedia. <laughs> now, brains love shortcuts. That's the way our mind works. It's our greatest strength, and on this topic of humanity, it's its greatest weakness. Our uptake is estimated at about 50 bits per second, about our information intake relying upon prior conclusions to inform current problems, discounting new variables regardless of their frequency. Confirmation bias, the first thing we've come to understand and know we continue to seek answers and explanations to reaffirm it's my original decision. In the world of neurological shortcuts, Africa becomes a country despite being the second largest continent with 54 countries. It's just too difficult to remember Yoruba, Wolof, 
Igbu or Zulu. Why choose from the five box crayon set? White, black, yellow, brown, red. When we could choose from the 64 or the 120 box set. Our shortcuts don't allow us to effectively consider alabaster, porcelain, ivory, honey, golden, almond, mahogany, almond, chestnut, espresso, or ebony. I'm a shade between golden and almond, but that just won't fit on the census form, will it? So the status quo bias reinforces a sense of conservatism in which change appears undesirable. Change would require rethinking and being open to considering prior conclusions were erroneous. Kenneth and Mamie Clark's doll test of children who demonstrated positive and negative attributes associated with color continues to be replicated and validated. In recent studies, even as recent as this year in collection, found that there was implicit association through implicit uh, through implicit association testing that there was bias upon based upon skin color it was evident as early as six months but not earlier than that so clearly it is an it uh, is an, its association is a developmental characteristic Ostracized or marginalized children exhibit increased behaviors of acting out or being less helpful, more aggressive, and ultimately completely disengaged. I am the splintering of America. I am not the shrapnel nor fragment, but the force that creates the sharpest point that can pierce the skin. The breaking apart of years upon years of attempts to remain right and rigid as a method for survival. So what purpose does media fulfill? Its purpose is somewhat storytelling to understand. T storytelling is to connect the emotional and didactic in a form that provides the affirmation to I am. Storytelling invokes creation and construction of self. The dominant commercial media has usurped the ritual of storytelling and it does so through reduction then seduction. Let me boil this down into the simplest messages and then get your emotions to lock it in. Simply put, boy meets girl, girl likes smile, boy buys toothpaste. <laughs> a medium of manipulation to aggregate the largest possible number of viewers. Children now in the age up to eight years old, digital screen viewing up from 15 minutes in 2013 to 48 minutes in 2017. You've heard the statistics. According to the AMA, individuals were exposed to over 10,000 brand messages a day with over 21 screen switches in an hour and an attention span to eight seconds. So new digital, me new digital media tools are using personalization to drive reach and consumption. The algorithms that drive that search and that delivery and machine intelligence are served up by personal, uh, that personalized content is limited by the biases of the developers. So now we have a whole nother realm we need to be thinking about, not just in terms of creation producers, et cetera, but also what's happening in software. I am the splintering of America. I am the living proof that America had not lived up to its creed of a government of, by, and for the people whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity. So here it is, that call to duty, and I'll wrap up because I'm getting the sign. Okay. Demand and fund digital media literacy starting in kindergarten. Empower the next generation with the tools to detect, deconstruct, and disable that which is not in their interest. Use digital and social media on your terms, not their terms. Finally, consider to make progress. We often reject the past as an inadequate means to a more vibrant future, such as the case with Josiah Henson. In our desire to make change, let's recognize those prior accomplishments within their respective contexts as progress in the long path to justice and reconciliation. From Jaron Lanier, when you change the contents of your circle, you change your concept of yourself. I am the splintering of America. I am not the ax, not the mall, nor the wedge. I am that which seeks the resonance of self-evident truths 
that all are created equal and shall be able to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to all of our panel guests. Coming up, we'll be inviting our audience to join the conversation. But first, we have a short video to share. As you know, today's program is part four of our Josiah Henson Leadership Conference. We've been honored to host some phenomenal speakers throughout the series, as we are today. The clip you're about to see is from one of them. Stephanie Young joined us for our, our second Josiah Henson Leadership Conference, titled Self-Determination, Collective Responsibility, and Emancipation. At, time, at that time, Stephanie was working for the White House as President Obama's senior liaison to the African American community. She spoke to the importance of minority representation in the media and shared a personal story about the first time she saw a then Senator Barack Obama on TV. Take a look. Way back when, um, in 2008, I still remember the day uh, that he gave uh, that speech on March 18th. Um, actually, it was 2007, I believe. Um, it was in Chicago, and he talked about race. Uh, and I remember I was working at the News Hour, Jim Lehrer, and PBS at the time, and I remember hearing him speak and looking at some of the other black folks in the room, um, in the newsroom, and just feeling like, oh my gosh, he's. I've never heard a black person speak about race like this um, before publicly. It was almost like he brought that conversation out of the closet uh, and spoke about it in a way as, as though to make you feel like my voice is being heard. He's speaking for me, he's speaking for us. Um, and so much pride, but also so much relief in that moment um, because he really, I think, uh, open the eyes of so many people who might not have been tolerant, didn't want to really hear about it, and really maybe just didn't even think about it from their own experiences. And I think that's what's been so powerful about this presidency um, and this administration, um, simply the imagery, simply you know the history of where they come from and knowing you know that slaves built the White House. And the First Lady just said that um, a couple of days ago during a speech when she was giving a commencement speech in New York, but just simply making that acknowledgement because we want to sweep it under the rug. I'm proud to walk into the White House every day and know that I come from a strong people and knowing that, um, that parts of my family were enslaved here in the United States and never could have imagined a moment like this. And I think that um, as we continue to, to move forward and as more people embrace that history uh, in pride and instead of shame, I think that that will do, um, do wonders. We would like people to come up one at a time and ask any question of our panel that you might have. Just remember, it's called Q&A. Ask your question, and everyone will answer. That way, we'll have time to get to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So um, in regards to Black Panther, what do you all think about the comparison of Chadwick Boseman's character to Martin Luther King and Michael B. Jordan's character to Malcolm X in that um, approach and message, even though they were both looking for the same result, just basically going from how they got there and yeah. So what do you all think about that? I think any um, opportunity that we have to show uh, positive uh, images of African Americans and particularly to this broad audience. Um, what I liked about um, Black Panther was that it was received worldwide by all types of audiences. And so for some people, it may have been the first time they'd ever seen an African American, American in that type of role. So from that perspective, uh, very good. The other uh, individuals you mentioned, including uh, Martin Luther King, we have to look at the uh, time period and, and the context. I think that each were important in their time, and 
And so each can be a giant or the one that leads to better understanding and a better appreciation of the whole of the African American in the world. I love that an analogy. I just think it's, it's really interesting that people started to talk about that almost immediately um, after the movie. And I think it's, it's very true um, in that we're trying to reach that, that same goal. And sometimes we have to come at it at different perspectives based on sort of our experience. And, and to add to that, I think the discussion is great, uh, having the debate about it. But uh, let's put it into context. Who owns Marvel? who framed that conversation in the first place. Um, so to that extent, there's still um, uh, many more examples of people who could may be made of comparisons of what the prototype of the character was trying to portray. Um, so uh, it wasn't a documentary, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, put it into context. So um, thank you all for being here. This is very informative and I appreciate it. Um, there are, I uh, think, lots of opportunities to continue the changing faces of what's projected in the media and the images. And I think that starts with uh, getting the uh, appropriate people um, in the development phase and sort of getting people involved with developing these images. And I'm wondering um, what programs or initiatives are in place to help our youth move into these positions that can help sort of transform what images are portrayed in the media? And if you all are aware of any, or anything pending. <laughs> well, most um, uh, schools, and in particular community colleges, have um, uh, programs that allow students to intern or um, have experiences in the real world studios and that kind of a thing. So I would, uh, if you're interested in your child getting involved in this particular industry, I would just check with the educational institutions uh, that you're interested in to see what programs and opportunities they have available. There's nothing that can substitute for the real world experience. That coupled with what they get in the classroom is gonna make for them having a future in the industry. Yeah, I would just add to it, there are programs out there, um, and again, this gets into um, who owns the studios, uh, who backs, who green lights. Um, all of those are particularly challenges that are barriers at the moment. Um, and so I think we'll probably see more in the way of bypass with new entrants into the movie industry or the entertainment industry uh, that will probably tip that. And I think over time, and immediately what we're seeing is a greater corporate consciousness uh, such that those changes are being made more by corporations than by other factors. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next five years, how the events of what has occurred with Black Panther, for example, shifts and moves that particular dial. Um, I think it'll be even particularly interesting in another 50 years whether or not Black Panther becomes the Uncle Tom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, <laughs> you're talking about accuracy and the, the, how this, the fame of this film, uh, and you're talking about truth. So what would you say about the character? Because they saved the CIA, and he was like the hero. Um, but, the, but in the real story, they were the antagonist. They were the enemy. How would, so we have all of this fame, and we have uh, the movies being seen worldwide, but there's still some gross inaccuracies in there. I'd like you to speak to that. But the thing I liked about that <laughs> uh, was that it, it reversed the, the role that we had to play in the past. And, and that is, we were the ones that had to be saved, and it was always them coming to save us. Okay. So just to reverse that, I think, uh, had some redeeming value, if you will. So. Very powerful. Um, I think it is interesting, you know, that it, it was perceived that way. Um, but we were, you know, saving him. We were saving the world, in fact. And I, I think it was, was very telling and wonderful to see, you know. I've already seen it three times, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I think the quote goes something to the effect of uh, all, all generalizations are false. Mm 
including this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be careful that movies will make generalizations because mm -hmm. that's how they create plots in order to be able to fit a story within mm -hmm. 90 minutes to 120 minutes. Um, so um, we shouldn't be expecting truth in documentary work out of <laughs> fictional film. It was a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> so, but stories are always being retold, right? So history is being retold and reconstructed. Um, we need to guide that process as we go along, hold people accountable, hold corporations accountable. All right, well, thank you. I want to just thank you, thank all of you for joining us today. I would like to thank the panelists and all the people that asked questions of the panelists. Now, this wraps up this part of the conference. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.